morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Impossible, wouldn't it? 
Is Jesus asking us to do something that we couldn't possibly do? How about Elijah? Was he taken up? Was sin? I don't think so. They were, they were all looking forward. They were looking forward to their Redeemer, to the cross, right? And we're looking backward, right? But we look forward as we look into the most holy place of the sanctuary where Jesus is now working. And why is he got to work? Because sins are continuing to come up to the sanctuary. See, we understand the old Jewish economy that there was a day of atonement. What, what is the day of atonement? The, the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? There had to be a day because all these sins would be coming into the sanctuary every day. They would be, be taking the land that, that represented Jesus. And they would take the blood and do what? Sprinkle it on this curtain, right? Can you imagine the way that would get to smelling after a while? After a whole year of blood just... And miraculously, on this day, it was clean. Clean. You know, Jesus cannot come back, brothers and sisters, until he has a people that are living like Enoch, living like Elijah. And we can't do this in and of ourselves. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that we have the power, you know. No. But through Jesus Christ, we can walk this walk. I mean, Jesus, would he ask us to do something that we couldn't do? No. He said, greater than these things you will do. He's given us the comforter. He's here with us now. Amen. You know, but I wonder how much of how much of us we give to him. Yeah. I believe that there is the problem. I, I want to continue to read in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. It, this isn't really a very difficult message. And, um, I want to stick to the spirit of prophecy of the Bible and um, let it lay there. For every high priest, this is uh, Hebrews 5, beginning in 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that they may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have com compassion on the ignorant. And on them that are out of the way. What is the way? Is that not Jesus? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason thereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. If there is people that have, I don't want to use too strong a word, but have taken this little sentence and just twisted it into all kinds of different things. And I'm going to leave, let that be. They stay there. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, what is his flesh? Our, our nature, maybe? His nature that he took on? Mary was his mother, correct? When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared... Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You think Jesus suffered? Oh, yeah. I think he suffered more than any man. He, he's called in the Bible what? Acquainted with grief? The man of sorrows? How much sorrow do we know? What, what is our capacity to understand the kind of sorrow? After being made perfect, he became the author. After being made perfect, he 
he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. I want to read you guys a little something for all you A students. This will be from uh, Desire of Ages, uh, page 762, which is chapter 79. And I'm going to start at uh, 72, 762. The law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character. And this man has not to give. Amen? This is why we need Jesus. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, coming to the earth as man, lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. These he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. His life stands for the life of men. Thus they have remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. More than this, Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. <coughs> that sounds pretty wonderful, doesn't it? That, that is pretty amazing. I, I mean, we ought to be saying hallelujah to that. Huh? He builds up human character after the similitude of the divine character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty. Thus the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. God can be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And that's Romans 3.26. Praise the Lord. God's love has been expressed in his justice no less than his mercy. Justice is the foundation of of his throne and the fruit of his love. It had been Satan's purpose to divorce mercy from truth and justice. He sought to prove that the righteousness of God's law is an enemy to peace. But Christ shows that in God's plan, they are indissolubly joined together. The one cannot exist without the other. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. By his life and his death, Christ proved that God's justice did not destroy his mercy. But that sin could be forgiven. Amen. And that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Do you believe the spirit prophecy? Amen. There it is. Satan's charges were refuted. God had given men unmistakable evidence of his life. Another deception was now to be brought forward. Satan declared that mercy destroyed justice. That the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. Had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not have died. But to abrogate the law would be to immortalize transgression and place the world under Satan's control. It was because the law was changeless, because man could be saved only through obedience to its precepts, that Jesus was lifted up upon the cross. Yet the very means by which Christ established the law, Satan represented as destroying it. It's a master of flipping things around, isn't he? You can't even trust your own thoughts sometimes, brothers and sisters. We have got to be united with Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, you take the wisest man the Bible says ever lived, Solomon, right? And how did he, he was defeated by what? By wise. They took him down. He barely made it back. Here will come the last conflict of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. That the law which was spoken by God's own voice is faulty. That some specification has been set aside. Is the claim which Satan now puts forward. 
It is the last great deception that he will bring upon the world. He needs not to assail the whole law. If he can lead men to disregard one precept, his purpose is gain. Amen. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. By consenting to break one precept, men are brought under Satan's power by submitting human law for God's law. Isn't that what the problem was with the Pharisees and the scribes in Jesus' day? Isn't that what they did? You know, Jesus was keeping the law. They thought they were keeping the law, but they were keeping man's law. This work is foretold in prophecy of great apostate power, which is representative of Satan. It is declared, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand. Men will set up their laws to counterwork counter the laws of God. They will seek to compel the consciences of others, and in their zeal to enforce these laws, they will oppress their fellow do you see it happening? The warfare against God's law, which was begun in heaven, will be continued until the end of the world. Every man will be tested. Obedience or disobedience is the question to be decided by the whole world. All will be called to choose between the law of God and the law of men. Here, the dividing line will be drawn. There will be two classes. Every character will be fully developed, and all show whether they have chosen the side of loyalty or that of rebellion. Then the end will come. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. Satan and all who have joined him in rebellion will be cut off. Sin and sinners will perish root and branch. Satan, the root, and his followers, the branches, the word will be fulfilled to the prince of evil because thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Then the wicked shall not be, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and shall not be. Then shall be as though they had not. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejecters of his mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life. And when one chooses the service of sin, he separates from God and thus cuts himself off from life. He is alienated from the life of God. Christ says, all that hate me love God. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop the character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the results of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Do you see how these people destroy themselves? This isn't God destroying anything. God doesn't seek to destroy. They just said God is love. Period. A doubt of God's goodness would have... Okay, hang on, I missed something here. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host had then been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished, but it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as an evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. But not so. When the great controversy shall be ended, then the plan of redemption having been completed, the character of God is revealed to all created intelligence. The precepts of his law are, to be, are seen to be perfect and immutable. The sin has made manifest its nature, Satan his character, 
then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight to do his will and in whose heart is his law. When then the mighty the angels rejoice as they look upon the Savior's cross, for through they did not then understand all, they knew that, that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward, when upon the cross he cried out, It is finished. Praise God that he did that. Praise God that he did that work, because... If, if, if there isn't the cross, then nothing else matters. I, you're, you're still in Hebrews. I want you to turn to Hebrews um, 9. Hebrews 9, and we're going to begin in 23. <laughs> It was therefore necessary that the patterns of these things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So what, what is that saying right there in verse 26? What is the whole purpose that Jesus died on the cross? To put away sin. And, and we I, th I think we're just comfortable here. I think we're real comfortable. I think we get comfortable in these lives that we live on this planet. And we don't realize how dark, how dark it is. You know, Pastor, just what week before last, spoke about Esther, right? We, we studied a little bit about Esther. And there's this wicked villain in the book of Esther, right? The name Haman comes to mind, right? Yes. Oh, that's awful close to my name, Raymond. <laughs> <I'm> scary. <laughs> but uh, th this wicked character wants to do away with God's people, right? He, he, he has this wicked scheme that he puts together, and he has the he has the, the king Azuerus put his ring on these these papers that, that that all the Jews should be destroyed. And the king, I, I don't know, he didn't even realize that his beautiful wife is a Jew. I mean, do you talk to your wife? I, I don't know. Anyways. So, so the story goes, and Esther gets wind of what's happening through Mordecai, right? And what happens? We're called into a what? A three-day fasting prayer vigil to get serious, to put away sin, and seek God's face because... You know what? There's some serious things going on here. When it, when it comes to life and death, you, you generally get people's attention. You, know, you can get most people's attention when you grab their wallet. That gets, that gets my attention. It gets most people's attention. But when you grab somebody in life and death, you really get their attention. Right? So she has this cause for everybody to have this three-day fasting and prayer. And she doesn't even wait the whole three days. I mean, it's the third, it's not a full part of the third day, right? Just like people say, oh, well, Jesus wasn't three days. Well, wait a minute. 
if you really study this thing out and you take a look, it began in the garden. That's where Jesus suffered more than he did on the cross. It was in the garden of Gethsemane, Thursday evening, where he suffered like you can't even imagine. The only place in the Bible where we hear God saying, that, where Jesus is saying to God, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Right? The first time you hear him say, I don't want to do your will. Right? No, well, it's not real. I mean, I'm scared in my humanness. But he says, nevertheless, your will be done. Right? So, anyways, back to Esther. Part of the third day, she's, she goes in before the king. And where does she go? Did, did you read? Did you ever pay attention to that? What, what it says about this place? This is, this is like the holy place. This is a magnificent hall. This is where the king, nobody's allowed to just step in there. You have to be invited to this place. Yes. Okay? This, this is, this is uh, representing the most holy place. And, and Esther is representing Jesus Christ. Do you, do you see the typology here? She walks in there with her best clothes. She's got it. She's dressed to the nines, okay? And she has prayed. And she has done everything. And she's confessed. And she's, she's done everything that she can do. Amen. And it doesn't say in there that she goes in there scared to death. Uh -uh. She comes in there boldly. She says, you know what? If I perish, I perish. She comes in before the king and the king sees her. And what does he do? He holds that scepter out for her. And what does she do? She boldly grabs on to it. Right? Boldly. She's representing us. This is the way it's supposed to be, brothers and sisters. What do you think we have all these, these stories? All these stories are typologies to help us, to show us, to prepare us for what's coming. And she, she has this desire. The king offers her half of the kingdom, anything that she would desire. What does she desire? She desires that she would prepare a meal for the king and for Haman. And Haman, boy, he's really thinking he's got it going on now, right? He goes home, brags to his wife and his whole family about how he's like, he's it. You know, the king wants to, for some reason, I can't remember exactly what it was. Maybe somebody does. The king has to look back through the books and finds out that this Mordecai guy, he couldn't sleep. Yeah, he couldn't sleep. I wonder why. I wonder why. Somebody was knocking on his door, you think? He couldn't sleep. I'm telling you what, God can do anything. In a moment, He can yes. turn the tide of anything. There is nothing He can't do. I'm telling you, if everything looks like it's just impossible, there's no way out. There is a way out. God will just boom. He speaks in it, it is. He, he, he says things, He makes things come into existence out of nothing. This is how powerful our God is. We need to learn to trust Him. We need to learn to listen to Him. And give him what he wants, which is our hearts, because they're wicked and they're evil. And there's not a darn thing we can do to make them right. Jesus said, give me that wickedness and I'll give you my righteousness. What a deal. What a deal. You can't get a better deal. I don't care where you go on this planet. There is no better deal. So she makes this, this banquet for these guys. And the tide gets turned, doesn't it? Haman ends up going to the gallows that he made to hang Mordecai. Right? Whew. And then what happens? Mordecai's riding all over the place getting the Jews prepared so that they can defend themselves. And not one Jew dies, does he? Not one Jew dies. But many of the detractors do, don't they? Yeah. We're full of detractors. And it's a shame. Because this church is set up for a reason and for a purpose. And it's going to go through. 
I don't care what it looks like. It's going to go through. God has promised it. He said it. Every word he's ever said has come to pass. That's right. He has never failed and he never will fail. Amen. I hope and pray that it be us. Yes. Why? Why will we lay in the grave? Revelation 19.7. What does that say, Revelation 19.7? Revelation 19.7. Interesting little verse there. Y'all there? Yeah. Let us be glad and rejoice.